Welcome and thank you for joining us for this session, Collaboration for NG911, A State Perspective. I am Sandy Dyer, I'm with the DataMark team, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Before we begin, I'd like to let everyone know that we are recording this session for viewing at a later time. All attendees have been muted for quality assurance purposes. We do encourage questions through the use of the Q&A section of this platform. We will answer them at the end of the presentation. Excuse me. I personally am very excited for this session today. We have a fantastic panel of representatives from states from across the country with backgrounds in 911, GIS, or both 911 and GIS, who have varied experiences with next generation 911 deployments. Some are early adopters, some are at the planning or early stage of deployment, while others are in the transitional stage of NG911 migration. Joining us today on our panel is Greg Bunce, GIS Data Coordinator with the State of Utah Automated Geographic Reference Center. Jason Horning, Next Generation 911 Program Manager with the North Dakota Association of Counties. Kenneth Nelson, Geographic Information Officer with the State of Kansas. Megan Compton, Geographic Information Officer with the State of Indiana. Monica Million, Executive Director with the Colorado 91 Resource Center and the current president of the National Emergency Number Association, had planned to join us today, but I don't believe is going to be able to. <coughs> and Michael Fashaway, GIS Analyst with the Montana State Library. Thank you all for participating in this discussion today. This is planned to be truly a discussion, not necessarily just a question and answer. Um, so for our audience, the questions that were developed for this session are broad in scope and free from technical references in order to accommodate a large audience with differing interests in next generation 911. If you have a more specific question for one or more of our panelists, please use, uh, please use the Q&A section in order to uh, get that answered. We'll try to get, we'll either try to um, accommodate it during the discussion or it may, it may wait till the end. I do apologize. I have a small cough today. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So next generation 911 is a complete replacement of our current 911 system to include the replacement of the analog voice network with an emergency services IP network, also known as an ESINET, replacement of the public safety answering point, which is called a PSAP, are also known as a 911 center, their 911 call handling equipment with equipment capable of processing calls from the new environment. And then the use of a GIS based system within the next generation core services for 911 call location validation and routing. Michael and Megan, what efforts have been taken in your state to implement one of these aspects of the NG91 environment? So this is Michael with the uh, state of Montana. Um, in Montana, we've uh, we've made a little progress on all of them, uh, but haven't seen anything quite to the the end. Um, so I'm going to kind of touch a little bit on all of them. In our 2017 legislature, uh, they freed up a number of uh, funding mechanisms to to work towards some of this. One was uh, funding a first ever statewide 911 planning effort, um, which we're just kind of wrapping up now. Um, so that was trying to kind of galvanize and, and get all the parties together and start coming up with a plan to move forward. Um, they also allocated um, some funding for uh, development of an ESINET. Um, a lot of our PSAPs are currently on an IP network, but not all of them. So the goal was to finish out getting the rest of our, our PSAPs on that network. There's been some issues since then in terms of how to actually use that funding based on the way our statutes and stuff are written. So that's kind of one of the hiccups um, that we're kind of experiencing on that front. Um, that same legislature also created a grant program for PSAPs. Um, using 25 cents of our dollar 911 fee. Um, 
and with that, the PSAPs have over the last couple of years been um, using those funds to upgrade things within the PSAP. Um, so there is some, some progress on that front. Uh, also on the GIS side, that 2017 legislature gave some funding to the Montana State Library to coordinate a uh, GIS data assessment um, on behalf of all the PSAPs. Um, so we wrapped that up a little over a year ago. And since then, the PSAPs have been kind of working on their own to uh, take those results and improve their data and get it ready for next gen, or next gen 911. Um, so that kind of covers it a little bit on my side. And I can let Megan speak. Sure, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so in Indiana, we elected to build out two redundant ESI nets, uh, one within digital and one with AT&T. And we did that because in the event of an outage, then both the telecom providers would have the ability to back each other should one of the ESI nets fail. The in digital ESI net uh, build out was completed in 2015. So we do have a, a finished statewide ESI net. Um, and since that fit completion was just in 2019, upgraded to a G19 network. Um, so we're ready there. The AT&T build out has taken a little bit longer. Um, AT&T and the board uh, recently agreed um, to upgrade networks from the, the time to market model to a newer uh, national model in 2019. So that process is undergoing right now. Um, it's actually, it, it has a very aggressive timeline to get completed um, so that we do have both as that's done. The board feels and finds that this is sort of the, one of the baselines that we need to complete. So um, at and has taken a very aggressive approach to completing that, uh, the transition of those PSAPs. Um, it was originally scheduled for completion by September of 2020. However, uh, due to now the COVID-19 um, restrictions and the PSAPs wanting to be as cautious as, as possible as we can of course imagine, uh, the timeline's going to be adjusted. The um, Indiana has suspended the on-site visits now uh, by the AT&T technicians so that um, to complete the, the transition to that as you know, for the AT&T counties. So, um, Eight engineers from at and and in digital are continuing to test the core-to-core -core connectivity though. So even those that were transitioned were constantly testing those cores. On the uh, equipment front for the call handling equipment, the 911 board um, handles grant funds that come from the 911 fees and they have initiated some replacement of the call handling equipment, um, I believe for the majority of the PSAMs. And my understanding is that most of those PSAPs are ready. We also allow the grant funds to be utilized to upgrade those pieces of equipment, be making sure that um, they meet the next gen 911 requirements. Wow, so, thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, it seems like, wow, both of you have taken a really, really active uh, engagement, your states have in deploying next generation I one and that's exciting to hear. <clears throat> Many times in order to implement components of NG911, it was learned that current legislation, tariffs, procurement processes, funding, or sometimes how 911 is supported organizationally didn't support the elements necessary for NG911. Greg and Ken, can you please discuss what efforts, if any, were taken to create the proper environment to support NG911 technologies in your state? Yeah, good morning from the great state of Utah. Just to throw you off, I've got an Arizona map um, <clears throat> on the side there, just, just to keep it fun. I spent a little time there, but uh, yeah, thanks to, to Michael Baker and Data Mark for, for letting us participate in this. So it's, this is fun to be part of it. Um, so in Utah, the kind of the way I see it is we have three separate ways you can, you know, the legislature kind of breaks up the 911 world. And so under our Utah Communications Authority, we have a 911 division. Um, they kind of set up best practices, um, standards, they set up procurement, which we're actively involved in right now for setting up the ESI net and the core services. Uh, we're in contract negotiations as of now. Um, they also work with a lot of the PSAPs to, to pass down money for 
um, the CPE, um, the customer premise equipment. And then we have, you know, secondly, then we have the PSAPs um, and they're kind of in their own funding world. And then we have HERC, which is us, which is the Automated Geographic Reference Center, which is really just the state GIS office here at the state of Utah. Um, so similar sounds like to Montana, there is a, we have an emergency service charge of 80 cents um, per access line and that gets billed monthly. And then the, the funds kind of get doled out to those three, three agencies from there. Um, the, the, the 911 division gets about 8%, um, the PSAPs get about 71% and then our GIS office gets one cent out of that, which amounts to about 300 and 30 to 40, about $335,000 a year. We use that money um, basically to, to build out GIS data sets for next gen 911 and then we support some PSAPs and that that's also being put down and uh, so on the dispatch side that money we're, we're supporting those and handing off uh, the data to them and kind of working with them so in a sense that that's good because it puts us front and center with with 911 data at the state level um, let's see here yeah, so also it, having the 911 division has kind of been good because they've been able to coordinate a lot of a lot of the, the, the higher level moves. So they were able to, to put together the information to get the grant, the federal grant um, that we're now using to put in place to, to start building the core services in the EziNet. Um, and we were able to get money from that. So yeah, that, that's, that's Utah, so I'll pass it to Ken. Okay, <clears throat> I think, um... Really the single most important thing I could point to for Kansas was the passage of the Kansas 911 Act in 2012. Um, this really set in place everything we've done uh, since then. It got the structure right for Kansas and this has evolved over time. And certainly that structure will look different, different in, in every single state. Um, but this provided a legislative mandate um, to develop strategies for future enhancements to our 911 system. Uh, it didn't specifically say next generation 911, it just said enhancements. Um, but it created our state 911 council. Uh, the predecessor to that was the Enhanced 911 Wireless Advisory Board. Uh, on the council, it added legislative representation, so it sort of elevated the, the stature of that council. And then that really spawned off <clears throat> every activity that took place thereafter. So creation of committees, subcommittees, our technical committee that, that really conducted all the planning, uh, pilot studies that later led to um, shaping of the RFP for um, our uh, GI, GIS data um, development and remediation project. Uh, the RFP for build out of our state, initially our state IP network, which later uh, evolved into our ESINET um, uh, security committee, um, led to hiring our first state 911 uh, admin position, also centralized a funding source. Prior to that, um, every county could establish their own rate and the rates were different based on uh, type of service. Uh, the cap was at 75 cents. So with that, it established a consistent rate across the state. And then those funds were collected at the state level and, and, dis, and distrib, distrib, <laughs> distributed. Um, so it just provided some consistency and then really set us on a path forward and brought together a lot of subject matter experts. Um, so um, that act was revised just this last year. A lot of it was bill cleanup. Uh, it also raised the fee to 90 cents and then um, designated that 23 cents of that uh, was provided to the council specifically to uh, maintain and enhance our existing system. Uh, it also made GIS data maintenance a requirement before that. Um, it was encouraged. We have good participation from all the data maintainers across the state. Um, but that was really, uh, we got there through a lot of coordination and outreach. Um, we were able to get GIS data maintenance added to the legislative revision as a requirement. Um, we hope to, you know, never enact that administrative regulation, but it is there as an insurance policy. So um, there's certainly been a lot of great work that has been done, especially on the technical side. Uh, we have a great team. Many of you probably know Sherry Massey. She's kind of our, our one of our main leads on the GIS side. But <clears throat> that's the one thing I can point to. I think if that hadn't happened, uh, with our act in 2012, um, 
we wouldn't be where we're at today. We may have a lot of sort of have and have nots. We've had centers of excellence throughout the state, but we wouldn't have a statewide system like it, like it exists today. Um, so that that's probably the biggest thing because that set the stage for everything that's that's happened since. And I think Monica's next. Well, and I think you bring up a really good point. Um, so I know even with my experience in my state, I mean, we were lucky enough that our um, legislation was uh, generic enough to where uh, modifications didn't need to be made to bring in new enhancements, new types of doing business, um, but could it have been approved upon? Probably, right? Because there's so many unknowns going forward. And, you know, while uh, existing tariffs considered um, maintenance of MSAGs and alley da databases and even, you know, accounted to, for funding for that through, um, through the tariff itself, I have to admit uh, the supporting of GIS was kind of um, still a responsibility of the communities. Not that, I mean, they were willing to do it, right? Because 911 is very local and, and it's supporting their communities. But the fact that you were able to get legislatively um, that new database written into, uh, into legislation to get supported, I think is really fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's been key. Like you said, the, in 2012, it, it specific, specifically mentioned develop strategies for future enhancements. Like I mentioned that, um, and there were some visionaries in that group, certainly from the GIS perspective, we weren't involved in 2012 directly, but it left enough leeway for those visionaries. They left them room to operate um, but because it didn't tie their hands too much, but certainly there was, there was, um, you know, room within that legislation to, to be creative it, because it wasn't so specific, but it gave them the mandate to, um, develop those strategies for the future enhancements. And that, and that's what has got us where we're at. Wow. It sounds like, um, folks, anyone on the call who's looking for, um, model legislation, you may want to look towards Kansas. Thank you. So the next topic is some have found many challenges to the planning and implementation of NG911. NG911 in itself is just a daunting topic. For some, just knowing where to get started can be a challenge. Now this question is for Jason and Michael. What is one of the biggest challenges you have faced from a public safety or GIS perspective in the planning and implementation of NG911? And why was it a challenge? Jason? Thank you, Sandy. Hello, everyone from North Dakota. Uh, thanks to Datamark for having us. It's a pleasure to be here uh, sharing uh, our perspective from, from North Dakota. Uh, it's, it's probably not surprising to hear that the first place to start and also one of the biggest challenges is governance. You're, you're gonna need a strong governance to get through this transition, but you're also gonna need a project champion who feels that through governance, they have the responsibility and authority to make it happen. I was lucky in that I came into an environment at uh, NDACO, which is our North Dakota Association of Counties, where governance had kind of already been worked out. Uh, we are a, a home rule state where all the 911 surcharge revenue is sent to the counties who in turn remit a portion of their revenue to us at NDACO for program management of, of NG911. Because NDACO is effectively a representation of the counties themselves, all of our counties were already committed to NDACO providing statewide leadership. To achieve this, they leveraged their statutorily assigned joint powers authority and authorized us to enter into 911 contracts on their behalf. So I would say governance is probably the biggest challenge, even though I, we really didn't have to, or I personally didn't have to work uh, through all those details. There was a lot of ground laid before I got here and it was a challenge to get everybody on board. Uh, I was just lucky that these relationships and, and trust is already established before I got here, but I don't think we can underestimate um, spending the time necessary to establish good, good governance. As for the challenges beyond governance, I guess the next biggest challenge, and this is more of a GIS data issue, uh, is making a decision about how to handle community values on our, on our address data. Early on, I gave our PSAPs the option to migrate from MSAG communities to something more simplistic, um, which would have meant, met our E901 transitional and NG901 needs. 
the first option was to migrate MSEG communities to uh, a county name or an incorporated city value. The section, uh, second option would be to migrate from an MSEG community to a post community. The former, which would have given us the ability to reach NG911 much quicker uh, because the, the county boundaries and incorporated city boundaries are very, fairly cleanly demarked and well known. Whereas postal communities on the other hand are, as, as probably some of you know, very difficult to, to track down and um, assign um, properly based on um, mail routes and that sort of thing. So we ultimately chose the latter and I'm, I'm thankful that our PSAPs did. Uh, I'll probably expand a little bit more on, on why I thought that was a good decision a little later on. With that, I'll, I'll just turn it over to Michael. So um, I'm kind of glad both Ken and Jason kind of mentioned the governance because um, I feel like that's one of the one of the aspects where we struggled in Montana with. Um, in addition, just to kind of the overall change and how Next Gen 911 impacts and and needs to be set up. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that our legislature a few years ago did allocate some money towards these various projects. Um, but it, one thing I didn't mention was it really was one-time funding um, and it didn't necessarily change the uh, roles or responsibilities in how 911 operates in, in Montana, which similar to North Dakota and I think a lot of places, you know, it's at the local level, usually counties, but um, handful of cities and and three tribal PSAPs here in Montana. Um, and to a large extent, that overall governance is still at that level. Um, we have a 911 advisory council um, that, you know, is working to try to, to organize all this and get all the PSAPs um, working towards next generation 911, um, but without a lot of uh, authority or direct responsibility, um, we've run into some issues, like I touched on earlier with the EZNet and some of that funding. Um, there's currently actually no way to actually procure an, to actually get an EZNet um, with it. So some of those things are kind of still very much a work in progress in in Montana, um, and you know I think it's just kind of the change in mindset, you know, from way, the way things used to be done to what kind of is, is the ideal way to, to approach it now, you know, in the next generation 911 landscape, so. Now we did receive a question that um, I think would, if it's okay, and any one of the panelists can answer this, uh, it seems applicable for the discussion currently. The question is, do any of your states have any auditing processes for ensuring proper spending? So given what Michael has just shared about his state um, and states that have found some success in this, what, what kind of auditing processes have you found? So I can, I can take a stab at this as a, as a state and I want administrator. We have a, um, expenditure guidelines that we share with our counties. It's important that we work closely with each of our PSAPs because they are receiving the 911 surcharge funds directly. Uh, so we um, have to go to each one of those agencies and follow up with them each, um, each biennium every couple of years uh, and asking them for some details on their finances, how much 911 surcharge they, revenue they received, uh, what they spent that revenue on, um, making sure that it falls within the expenditure guidelines. We've had some really good success with that. Uh, it may be a little bit easier. I, I don't wanna speak for other states. It may be easier for them to, to manage because all of the surcharge revenue comes to one point and it's easier to make sure it's being spent on the right things than it is when it's going to 53 different locations as it is in our case. And in Kansas, um... The, the council has a committee, it's an expenditure uh, committee, and they require all PSAPs to find a, file an expenditure report. Um, that goes through a, a portal that we host through our clearinghouse for the, the council, and all those expenditures are reviewed. Um, I'm, I don't serve on that committee, um, thankfully, 
uh, but all of those expenditures are reviewed to ensure that they follow the established guidelines. Um, yeah, really down to each individual uh, expenditure and then any of those that were funds are spent on something that wasn't allowable use those funds have to be um, paid paid back to the 911 fund um, one to just follow state legislation but also that helps keep you um, as i understand it keeps you eligible for for things like you know when when federal funds become available for grant purposes it's one of the things that they look at so uh, it's a pretty thorough process that's uh, established in, in our state. Um, and if you're interested in how we do, I can certainly put you in touch with those that are involved in kind of the, the day to day of that. And thank you. And that's a really, um, I'm glad you brought up the federal funding. There have been plenty of nine states specifically who have lost out on federal funding, like uh, the state I come from specifically because uh, 91 funds were used for things other than what they were intended for legislatively. And I think that that's important to point out that when we're going to do, uh, for lack of a better term, pass through funding to communities, that it's used specifically the way it was um, identified to be used. So we don't put future funding at risk. Thank you for your willingness to respond to that, that question kind of ad hoc. So next generation I1 deployments, it can happen in so many different ways and can be a single PSAP, regional, county, a multi-county project or a statewide implementation. Megan and Greg, this is a, actually a multi-part. From a public safety 911 or GIS perspective, did any of your efforts start with a single PSAP, regional, or multi-county project that then expanded until the entire state was completed? Or did you start as a statewide deployment only? And if so, what are the pros and cons of the type of approach that was taken to implement NG911? Make it? I do love the multi-part question, so thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm gonna speak at this from a GIS perspective um, and a little bit from a public safety perspective. But uh, from the GIS perspective, we have taken the approach to educate at the county level and the state levels about the need to marry the GIS and 911 for next gen 911 deployment. I should say that in Indiana, we are, um, we're not, at, I'm gonna put it, uh, we're not at the Kansas level for next gen 911 yet, where we don't, we, we lack some of the rules um, and some of the, um, driving forces uh, that the legislation comes, that, that comes with legislation. So we are, we have our state 911 board directing the NG 911 efforts. And as the GIO, it's our statutory responsibility to coordinate GIS data sharing and enact the data standards where necessary. So we have created a GIS data standard for addresses and center lines in Indiana. And this standard follows very closely uh, with the NINA standard. Um, our Indiana Geographic Information Council, our statewide council, um, it's a nonprofit, works closely with our office, coordinates GIS efforts for across the state um, with multiple levels of entities as many other statewide councils do. Um, they were instrumental in helping to develop and validate the new statewide standards. So Indiana will deploy NextGen 911 as, as a state effort but we've learned that the GIS data can be introduced into in um, phases. So those phases and adoption may look different in each county, depending on their GIS data readiness. So our goal has been to get the counties that want to start early, the tools and information that they need to get started. Some counties were fortunate enough to have staff already well coordinated with their PSAPs and started the process to match the center lines and the MSAGs early on. Our goal uh, since 2016, actually, um, when we started sort of really working on GIS and NG911 in Indiana, um, was to enable the counties that wanted to get started to have the information that they needed so they didn't have to take off and go down the path in one direction only to have to turn around and come back and go for from a different approach. So, uh, we wanted them to not have to redo the work. So we're trying to ensure that uh, right now, it's a very much on an education front to 
connect the GIS professionals with their PSAPs and vice versa. Um, also educating, we're really great, like I said in the beginning, uh, with our statewide ESINET. We're really great in our call handling, but our adoption of the GIS has been um, fragmented. So to the last part of your question, the, the pro to sort of this um, county and state approach, the, is, is our, the communication from the state to the counties and our continuing effort to link up our GIS departments with those, with those PSAPs. So for the last few years, we have been working through conferences and working through committees um, and presentations and coordination to share what's needed for the matching of GIS and 911 and why it matters. And counties have sort of on their own adopted to start working down the path of getting their data ready. The con to this approach, uh, I think we'll be told in the months ahead when we have inevitably overlooked some aspect of a business process at the local level. I, I anticipate a gap there. When you have state leadership over a project, um, even though we heavily involve our county um, GIS folks and, and 911 uh, experts, there, there will be something that we miss. Um, so it's, we do best in our state to be state driven and, and locally educated, I think, but we may get down to the project further and realize that we may have a workflow that needs to be excuse me, adjusted. So, Greg? Okay, thanks. So briefly, um, from a public safety standpoint, and, I, and my, my knowledge is limited here, but you know, they're currently leading a statewide um, you know, next gen 911 deployment effort. Like, as I mentioned before, we're, we are in contract negotiations with that. And, and that does include the, the ESINET, the core services and the CPEs um, at the PSAPs. Um, currently, I know we have two thirds of the PSAPs here. We have 30 PSAPs in the state. Two thirds of those are connected to an ESINET. Um, obviously the goal of this one is to, to further get everyone connected and, and, and complete that build out. Um, in the past, I'm not sure if that was what, what efforts were taken to get everyone connected. That it's possible that that was more of a, a PSAP by PSAP thing, but, but I know at this point in time, we're, we're, we're looking at that statewide. I'm gonna also kind of take this question similar to Megan and, and jump on the GIS side of it, because I feel like that's where I can speak the best now. And in Utah, we've, we've typically approached data and GIS um, from a statewide level. Uh, from early on. So back in the 1970s, there was discussions here in the legislature about building out complete, you know, GIS data sets where, within the divisions and kind of making sure that they were complete and they were in, in one location. So you get into the 19, 1982 AGRC, the state GIS office is established and that kind of mandates and said, you know, this, this office will catalog statewide data. Um, I'm not sure exactly what data existed back then, um, but then you get into in the 90s, 1991, there's some legislation that happens here that, that actually doles out money and legislates money to AGRC to build the statewide data sets. Um, and, and, and there's grant money involved in that. And that's when the funding starts to kick in. So this is before my time, but I know that, you know, sometime in the 90s, the statewide data of, of roads and address points became a big you know, push and AGRC would work closely with the counties. Um, sometimes this involved going down and just riding in vehicles with GPS units or just working technically with them to kind of build out address points and road center lines. This, that's been an ongoing thing. Um, I'd say it's, it's gotten a lot more mature. So the data sets have had a lot of work over time, a lot of hands on the data sets. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's, it's been county by county but also, and some counties are definitely more willing to work with it, but, but with the idea of actually having it all built out into one statewide data set. So that comes again with, with data models. Um, so we have the benefit of, of having a, a statewide data model for many of, the, many of the data sets we offer, including the center lines and address points. And we don't have any teeth in the game, but we, but we definitely encourage our users to adopt these data models and we work with the data models. Ours isn't exactly following the NINA. It, it's kind of a conglomerate between NINA, um, some, some DOT Arnold requirements and then some local 
um, data needs. So, we, so it, there, they can be a little bit of heavy, but um, but it but it works for the for the state. It works for the locals, and we can translate that data simply into into uh, the, the needed NINA formats. Um, pros, I guess, would be you know we have a good amount of control over of of getting the data. We all ha we all take ownership in it. You know we particularly at the county level, but, but everyone has a stake in this and everyone feels like they're involved in it um, and having the data models. And I guess cons would be, you know, back on the public safety side is the RFP that we're, we're going through now, you know, it, it's it, their large scale efforts to get things like this moving. And Greg, I think you make a, a really good point is what I love about our transition from legacy to NG91 and utilizing GIS as our platform is it allows us probably for the first time ever to be able to encompass 911 into um, existing businesses. 911 historically, we kind of lived on our island and we managed our data our way because it needed to work a certain way. And part of the transition is um, changing that mindset that it can still work within existing um, resources and platforms. GIS folks just need to understand what you needed to do. Um, and, and then we have access to so much more information and frankly, uh, cost sharing or more funding benefits, right? So like when you point out the uh, USDOT, the Arnold initiatives, by being a part of a larger data set that's supporting multiple business needs, well then you have multiple agencies or stakeholders supporting that data set where exclusively it was just ours. It was just ours to worry about and worry about how it's going to get maintained and funded. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's much better to have a single data set that we're all working toward. Obviously we, you know, there's, there's always the pushback of, oh, there's too much in this data set. There's too many fields, but I mean, you can turn fields off. You, you can yeah. manipulate things in that way, but we try to keep pushing forward that the fact that, you know, we don't want to have many data sets. Yeah, there, there is the issue of having, too many fields and too many uses, but but really we're the geom we're all using the same geometry and, co and using our forces collectively. Well, that's what ETL's for, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Easier to have it parsed and get it out the way you want than to have it uh, like legacy and getting it back down to where you can actually use it, right? So the lowest common denominator, if you will. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so the next discussion point is the 9-1 database that supports call routing today is the Master Street Address Guide, also known as an MSAG. We've come to learn that the replacement of an MSAG with a GIS-based call routing system may be a bit more complicated than originally realized due to a need to support legacy components as part of the migration to NG911. I remember early on, the NG91 messaging was the MSAG was going away and that panicked a good portion of our 91 community that they were losing their jobs in the next year or two. And uh, it's turned out it's still around and it's probably still going to be around. So this question is for um, Ken, Jason and Megan. What steps, if any, has your state adopted to compare the MSAG to the GS data sets being considered to support NG911? And what processes have been implemented to ensure that both the MSAG and the GIS data sets that support NG91 will stay reconciled while both are in use? Ken? Yeah. Uh, okay, so this one was um, definitely a learning process for us and one that's evolved over time. I'll admittedly um, came into this from the GIS perspective, so other than the acronyms, did not know uh, really anything about the MSAG or the TN database or, or sometimes referred to as the Alley database. And upon initial examination, you know, our take on this was, well, these are just the same thing as, uh, you know, the MSAG is the same thing as a road center line file, just without geometry. The, the TN record is like, like an address point, just doesn't have geometry. Um, so we, we quickly, quickly realized that this, this was a huge aspect to the project. Um, our first crack at this is, is the state went through its initial data enhancement project or data remediation project. Um, the first attempt was um, one of the required elements of that was um, what we call the MSAG, MSAG change spreadsheet. So a comparison of the MSAG database to the 
uh, newly created or newly enhanced um, road centerline file and the change spreadsheet uh, was provided to the MSAG coordinator indicating what changes would need to be made uh, to the, the MSAG database to bring those two into alignment. Um, that was adopted by some local jurisdictions, but um, not by others. Um, so that didn't work out as well, just because one was adoption and two we realized that that didn't really have a good maintenance plan behind it. It was sort of an initial step, um, but as we moved into data maintenance mode, once we had this initial step of, of data enhancement and remediation, um, we, we just quickly turned to um, um, data maintenance and that MSAG change spreadsheet was sort of a, a one-time shot. So um, on the heels of that, we um, started developing um, what we call our NG911 GIS toolbox. It's a, a set of Python tools that plug into our uh, GIS desktop or our Pro a variety of QA tools in there, mainly to test adherence to our, our state data model. Um, so our developer of that also added some, some checks in there to compare uh, telephone number records, uh, the TN list, or uh, the MSAG database uh, to uh, our authoritative GIS data. So data maintainers um, could do this in their shop um, as they edited their data. So that, that brought us closer to comparing more in real time as data maintenance was, was ongoing. Um, but as we, the, the real change for us was as we were approaching cutting PSAPs over to the ESINET, um, we went from an MSAG to a geo MSAG transition where um, essentially um, our core services provider in, in conjunction with, with AT&T, uh, we went through a, a process there of wiping out the existing MSAG, replacing it entirely with one created from our authoritative GIS data. But the requirement was um, that we had to not orphan any telephone numbers in that process. So we had to um, essentially prove that every TN record would route against our GIS data before, um, before a jurisdiction would be migrated over to the ESINET. So the GIS data uh, essentially was going to become the engine for the MSAG would be the geo MSAG, but we had to ensure that no telephone number records would be left behind. Um, so now it was a requirement if you had any um, junk records in your TN database um, and that you hadn't cleaned up before, those had to be cleaned up now or you couldn't migrate to the ESINET. Most of our jurisdictions were in good shape from their match rates, but um, that was the time in which all that stuff got cleaned up and, and sort of a, a final series of tests. Um, and in terms of um, ongoing maintenance, w once a, a jurisdiction uh, was migrated to the ESINET, the only way to edit uh, now the GOM SAG um, is through edits to the GIS data. So no direct editing of the, of the MSAG database um, is allowed. It's just through edits to the GIS data. Uh, Jason? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, I think uh, North Dakota is kind of uh, doing things pretty close to what, what Kansas is doing, but we'll, I'll, I'll step you through that. Uh, the first thing we ask our counties to do is get their GIS data where they want it. And if they don't have the resources to do that work, uh, we help them uh, get that done. We, we also don't ask them to compare anything with the MSAG at this stage. We only ask them to assign their addressing schema and community values in the optimal uh, and intended way. We also require currently because of the limitations of Alley that they use USPS publication 28 values along with the valid postal communities on their GIS roads and address points. We are using USPS uh, uh, elements uh, like pub uh, 28 and appendix C um, for, for types. We are splitting them out into NG911 elements. So whereas there used to be four elements, there, there's I think seven or eight now, um, but they are still, um, the values themselves are still following US Pub 28 because of the alley limitations. Uh, then once the GIS state is, is as clean as it can be, we compare our GIS with the live MSEG and make updates to the live MSEG to align with the GIS. As we do this work with the tel we work with the telcos to provide the necessary changes to their customer records affected by our MSEG updates. 
after the MSEG updates are made and carrier record, records are updated, we do a complete replace of the tabular MSEG with the GIS records and associated geo MSEG. There are inevitably some addressing ch changes that occur in this process in order to align with the intended addressing of the county and the counties need to make sure that the customers are receiving those notices along with the post office. I, I, I continually speak counties here, but it, I realize that for some of you that means working with a lot of cities too. Uh, when the switch to the GeoMSEG is ultimately made, we are effectively establishing a workflow whereby we send a copy of our GIS data to our NG911 system service provider. The service provider then on their end turns the submitted GIS data into MSEG change requests. And uh, eventually when our state is completely migrated over to a GeoMSEG, we will start the process of implementing NG911 functional elements and working with the carriers to make the migration fully spelt out uh, address elements. To answer the second part, part of the question, we don't have processes to ensure that the, that the MSEG and GIS data sets stay reconciled. We submit, like Kansas does, our GIS data to the provider and the provider compares the previous GIS submittal with the current one and figures out the MSEG change requests necessary to keep everything in harmony. With that, I'll hand it over to Megan. Thank you, Jason. So in Indiana, um, the steps, with the state level, we have one MSAG that we use for our state police and 911. And then at the local level, everyone maintains their own county or PSAP level MSAG. So having two separate, or really 93, because we have 93 counties, but um, for 92 counties in the state. But so having separate MSAGs, it wasn't necessarily a goal to have just one that we reconciled the whole state MSAG. So our general preparation for this has been voluntary with, again, some counties getting out in front and helping with the others. So the state level MSAG is derived from, from GIS data. Um, that's how, that's how our, they built that. Um, the, we are working to, uh, in the form of education and information sharing. Um, we have the state leadership again, but we're also then um, really committed and fortunate to have a local GIS and PSAP partners that are helping us to drive the process at the local level, telling us, how do you want this done? How do you wanna see this process, the reconciliation between your MSAG and your GIS? Um, we've not determined necessarily that statewide, everyone has to do an MSAG to GIS comparison. And we're very much in the education phase of, of that. Um, some people say that it is necessary and some process say that it is not. Um, since we don't have uh, a, a process outlined yet, what we do have is we want, what, what I can tell you is what we want to do. We want to utilize our statewide data harvest, which is where we reach out to each of the counties and pull their data in. Um, that process is not a process that's legislated at this point. It's a voluntary process. So we're hoping to use that process to collect all of the state GIS data layers um, and get that data cleaned to the next gen 911 data standard. So as counties are starting to adopt the data standard, um, we can provide a process through which they can clean their data um, and share that up with the state. So where that responsibility lies though, is, is yet to be determined whether that stays with the 911 board, if that comes into our office, the GIO, if it, if it lands somewhere else, um, we, we haven't determined where what I call the core, where that's going to sit. Um, uh, our ongoing maintenance will hopefully help, is, is our intention is to build capacity at the local level to maintain this process. So we hope to just have the tools at the state to be able to enable the counties to get their GIS and MSAG reconciled if that's necessary, but really just to get their GIS data to the next gen 911 level. We wanna give you the tools to be able to do it and then proceed on so that it's not always a state directed responsibility. Um, that the, the opportunity to maintain your own process and your own MSAG or your own GIS data main stays at the local level. And then in order to support our statewide PSAPs, we would use that aggregated data that we pull from all of the counties to build a statewide MSAG as well. We do continue with uh, the calls and meetings and discussions about how to make this process work the best. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the back end of the process that we're anticipating, which is the re-education and information sharing to new PSAC directors, new GIS managers that come in 
um, we really want to make sure that we always have a process that we can educate them on um, so that we're not missing and having to go back and pick up counties that have lost some of that um, knowledge through, through um, employee changeover. Thanks, Sandy. No, oh, thank you, because that was the perfect segue into the next topic. I'll, I'll pay you later. Um, GIS has been used by PSAPs for a long time. Whether or not they realize it, they've been using it, um, other than maybe to complain that it wasn't working right. Um, I know part of my old role was, why doesn't this map work? Um, they've used it actually in their computer-aided or CAD systems for location verification, dispatching of field units, and AVL, automatic vehicle location applications, to display field units, determine closest unit routing, identify station move ups for fire and EMS. And then, you know, most commonly in mapping solutions to support landline and wireless 911 calls. In next generation 911, as we've discussed throughout this uh, time together, it will be used for 911 call location validation, call routing to the appropriate PSAP, which is technically a new business need of public safety GIS. Uh, Greg and Michael, what efforts have been taken to educate both public safety and GIS professionals in your state about the new business need? And what new relationships have been forged, if any, at the state, county, and local levels to support NG91 GIS needs? We only have about six minutes, so if um, any of the uh, other panelists would like to respond to this question, um, we can have this be the last one uh, if uh, due to time. Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, <clears throat> so again, our 911 division kind of is the, is the biggest one who reaches out and works closely with the PSAPs in our state. Um, this has kind of brought up uh, an interesting, a lot of interesting questions in our office, at least as being the, the data providers, because now as we move through this, you know, typically the, the, the PSAPs are maintaining MSAGs and, and we're working closely with the counties um, who are not getting 911 funding directly from the state. So we're working with them as kind of a, a, a mediator with the 911 world. Um, so now we find ourselves kind of in an interesting situation because we're, we're you know, the PSAPs are gonna take on a more responsibility with this and, and kind of moving it into some, some GIS, but the counties are still gonna be the ones that maintaining the data for us here. Um, so we kind of need to look at some of the funding models there and, and, and what's happening there. But I think um, for education wise and how we've been reaching out. So, so the 911 division reaches out to them often with best practices and rules and we're able to, to go through channel through them to kind of ask and request some, some ways to get data feedback. But really as a state office for GIS, we, we, we have a reputation over the long term here um, working with all the counties. We have a good relationship with each of them. So for us, it's, it's, we, we visit them probably you know, once a year, maybe every two years, um, some of the smaller ones, but, but we stay in contact with them um, every couple of months. We do blog posts um, that are widely read throughout the, the state GIS folks in the state. We've, we've um, implemented some guidelines and best practices. We put out a next gen 911 roadmap for our, for our data stewards and to kind of sh show where we're at. We're, we're still kind of in the getting the alley um, validated into the GIS. And so I'll probably have some questions for Ken offline when we, when we move closer to that. But, uh, and then we'll start working with the PSAPs um, closer as we really try to nail down the PSAP boundaries. We have the PSAP boundaries, but then we need to really get clear on some of the fuzzy areas and as well as the provisioning boundaries. So that'll, that'll be some more outreach and relationships for us with them. But last thing I'll say is with our 911 division, uh, our agency has definitely gotten to know them a lot more through this over the past couple of years. And we definitely have a stronger relationship with them now. Yeah, and in, in Montana, uh, we have a long history of doing statewide aggregation of GIS data sets, which included address points and road center lines, but we did it on a very informal um, basis and didn't have any real connection with the 911 community. So we have good relationships with, you know, a lot of counties and some counties just due to turnover and stuff, didn't have quite as good a relationships or or know who to contact. Um, but as NextGen has sort of started bubbling up, we started reaching out um, to our 911 advisory council 
and just trying to kind of reach out and explain, um, you know, what we felt like they needed to start knowing about GIS and that relationship improved a lot to the point where we were uh, given a seat on that council. And so we're now part of the discussion. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the major relationships that's been forged out of that. Um, we continually push out as much um, information, you know, whether it's new standards coming out um, from Nina and things like that, um, and just trying to help coordinate to the best um, of our ability, given we're, we're still in this um, stage where we have a role for statewide GIS coordination in statute, but it's not connected directly um, in any formal way to 911. So, um, you know, it's, it's an evolving process. I think um, we've started to develop better relationships at the local level, um, partly out of that data assessment project we coordinated for them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always an evolution. So we're working on it. And Jason, you've only had a couple of the questions, sir. Would you like a opportunity to respond to this one? I know North Dakota's had a lot of efforts in this area. No, I think to be respectful of time, we can move on to any questions that you may uh, have accumulated here. Okay, so the last question that um, has come up, because we've really tackled them during the session, is generally the more local the data is, the more precise. CAD is engineering scale typically. Local mapping is one to two inches, county, 10 foot, et cetera. Why not use all the levels of data together in one system and just clarify the accuracy of each? Do we have a panelist that'd like to try to tackle this one? That won't be me. Well, this is Jason. I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, uh, idea. We, we do it here uh, in North Dakota. We, we have a 10 meter sort of threshold, upper threshold or whatever the limit, I guess it was 13 point some feet in the NINA document. We try to try to stay under that, but we do keep a, an accuracy, um, you know, value on our data. So we know if we have time and the resources are allowed, uh, we can go back into those areas and clean them up and get them up, tight, tighten them up a little bit more. Yeah, I, I agree with the with the comment as well. I think we're we're still at the stage where we're at mapping grade at, at a statewide level for our road center lines and address points, and we're still working with the 29 individual counties. You know, we kind of take what we can get, but uh, but in general, it's it it follows along with with mapping grade um, accuracy. We do have some in house things and checks, but it but but we're kind of we'll we'll take what we're given. Yeah, this is <clears throat> Ken. We we have accuracy requirements within our within our standard. Um, our statewide ortho base is our is our base map. Unless the uh, local jurisdiction has something better, I think our I think our uh, ortho base is plus or minus two and a half feet. I'd have to go back and double check that. <clears throat> um, but that was sort of our photo base, um, and then we have accuracy standards within our within our standard, but the, the data is, is local. So we, we're not building any layers at, at the state level. We're aggregating all the data up from the local government. Those are either maintained by the local jurisdictions themselves or uh, by uh, a vendor um, of, their, of their choosing uh, to maintain again to our, our state data model. And the original submitter of the question to be a part of the conversation also offers it helps to justify data acquisition if you create boundaries of data and tag the quality and show to senior people. Um, not asking uh, anyone to follow up because I know that we are out of time, but wanted to include that um, because uh, we did premise this as discussion based. I want to thank all of our panelists and our attendees for joining today. Um, the next session, which is call taker dispatcher liability has already started. So if uh, I do apologize if you plan to attend that session and you'll be late. Everyone have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you.